Thank you, everybody. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. Well, that went well. Yep, yep. <laughs> what are these, hamsters? What are they? Are they Google things? What are they sort of the set design? They, they record whatever you say. Oh, they, 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 they use it against oh, you. Oh, so you dear, sorry. <laughs> dear. OK, so uh, what are we going to do today? So many people are here, so in my opinion, you're truly a Renaissance man. You did everything. I mean, I've been dead since the 15th century. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, what I decided to do again, uh, over the last couple of weeks, I asked for people to send me questions. And I got piles of questions. I felt like Ringo Starr receiving all these mails with questions. And uh, I divided them into different topics. Some of them I just threw away. I'm taking credit for all the questions, by the way. Excellent. So, uh, that's, that's for the Czech world we know. <laughs> yeah, so uh, again, you, you, you wrote somewhere, again, uh, regretfully, at some point I'll, I'll write, I'll read quotes that you made back to you. I hope it's okay with you. So you, you wrote in the book that there is nothing funnier than no one laughing. So, so, <laughs> so I, I, I'll try to provide the part in, the, in this talk, and you can make them laugh as much as you want, if, if this is OK. OK, maybe. OK, OK. I mean, that, that was specifically about when you mean to be funny. And there's an audience, you know. That, and then that <laughs> happened to us once on Python when we were on The Tonight Show in 1973. And uh, we were, we'd just toured Canada, and they laughed at everything we did. If we went on stage and farted, they applauded and stood up. But we were in America, and we were on The Tonight Show, and we started off by, Hello, Mrs. Thing! Hello, Mrs. Entity! And the audience was like this. <laughs> and we did... Uh, we had half an hour's material. We did it in 20 minutes. <laughs> and then we all ran outside in Burbank and lay on the ground and laughed our asses off. Because it was just so funny. It was just really funny. <laughs> That's what yeah. I remember. Anyway, so let's talk with music. Let's talk about music, if you don't mind, one of our mutual loves. Uh, like many English teenagers who grew up in the 50s... That's the president. <laughs> <laughs> the crucial liberating moment was watching Elvis and hearing Heartbreak Hotel. And uh, can you recall what you really felt when you first saw Elvis? And did you ever manage to meet him in person later on in life? I never met him, but we, we were, I was uh, 14, so I was at uh, 1957, so uh, he was, you know, he was everywhere. Well, since my baby left me, you know. We, we never see him. He was on television eventually, uh, but they'd only shoot him below the waist. <laughs> <laughs> American television, they're very prurient about that, because he was jiggling about, you know. Hey, above the waist, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> that was a different film, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> As I said, we were 14, you know, so we were very interested in what went on below the waist. But then eventually I found out, to my complete and total, I still can't come to terms with it, that he was an enormous Python fan. And he had all the tapes on his plane, and he called everybody Squire after my nudge nudge sketch. <laughs> Which was absolutely mind-blowing to me until I met Linda Thompson, who was his penultimate girlfriend. And she said that in Nashville at night, when the television went off at 2 o'clock or 3 in the morning, Elvis would make her sit up in bed with her and do Python sketches. <laughs> and not just any Python sketches. It was, hello, Mrs. Thing, I need a new brain! <laughs> now, I don't know if we can imagine Elvis sitting in bed doing that. <laughs> But apparently that's what he did with Linda Thompson. So I, I just, it's still, it's still mind-boggling, isn't it? I mean, it's boggling. Yeah. Uh, anyway, moving from the 50s to the 60s. <laughs> OK, if you don't mind. Python are often referred to as the Beatles of comedy. So uh, my question to you is, did you really meet the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Kings, all those great bands in the 60s in real life, in real time? Or? Yeah, I mean, we did, but, but that's because we were all the same generation. We all came out of the, of the war, all born at the end of World War II, and into this horrible world, which was, was rationing and bomb sites everywhere. And that generation sort of invented, it was actually a renaissance, they invented everything. They invented rock and roll, they, they, photography, uh, couture, fashion. Uh, it, was just, it was because there was nobody there. 
everybody was in the forces. So we were, and we were the ones who did comedy, and we were on television, but there wasn't anybody before us because there wasn't television. So um, we were very fortunate to go into a, a, a blank field, and if you can find a blank field in any, in any part of the world, that's really a good place to be because nobody's done anything, so you could hit all the spots first. Yeah, so again, we're moving to the 70s, and uh, very fast, we don't have a lot of time, so we have to move very fast. Uh, you were a distinguished member of the Ruttles, but, but before the singles and records and movies and Ruttlemania and everything, there was this Rutland Weekland television. Can you tell us a little bit about it, and why do you decide, for example, that there should be no live audience for this specific? Well, it, it was after Python finished, and I sort of hadn't... I still like writing sketches, so I had my I got a, my own little television series from the BBC called Rutland Weekend Television, and Rutland is the smallest county in England, and actually they'd made it extinct. So I like the idea of being their, their television station, and it was Cleese's title. I paid him a pound for it, uh, and we did it from a tiny little studio, which was really the weather forecast studio, and we had to lift all the sets upstage. It was made. I think the whole series cost thirty thousand pounds. So, but from that came a joke I wrote called about the Ruttles, because they were the Rutland version of the Beatles. And so I took that to uh, Saturday Night Live when I was hosting, and they put it on TV, and uh, people wrote to the Ruttles. It was amazing. So but then we, began, we made the full documentary for NBC. Yeah, and this was a huge success. And, and why did you choose to play Dirk McQuickly? Yeah. Originally it was George, but then you switched to Paul. I, in the original one on our TV show, I played the George character, but I couldn't find anybody, because Neil Innes played Lennon, and he did, a really, he did him really great. And I couldn't find anybody to balance Neil. So I had to sort of do that role, because I was really playing the interviewer all mm -hmm. the time, which yeah. was fun. But, uh, but then I, I sort of, I thought, well, I've, I've got to get, <laughs> play Dirk McQuickly which is quite nice, because then I came face to face with Paul McCartney, <laughs> just after I'd played him. <laughs> and <laughs> he was with his wife, Linda, and she really loved it, and he wasn't quite sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was mocking his little eyes that he would do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he, well, he's, he's very, he's good friends now. He like, they all like the Ruttles now. Yeah. George would only, re George would only, Harrison would only refer to the Beatles as the Ruttles. <laughs> from them, and, and, yeah, it, that, he would always talk about the Ruttles, what we're doing now, the Ruttles. Yeah. And, and, and there's also a story about George and Ringo actually playing uh, yeah. a song. We were visiting, um, my daughter and I, she was, we, one, uh, we were visiting Friar Park, which is an extraordinary house in Henley where George lives, it's gothic place, and Ringo was there. And they both picked up guitars and started to sing Ouch, which is the parody of help in, in, the, in the Ruttles. And it was like the world had just turned upside down. You know, this is really bizarre. Uh, moving on. <laughs> this is my job here. I need that. all right. No, you're, must, doing, must you're doing good. On. You're doing good. OK, OK. Thank you. Um, you have achieved some unprecedented act by singing the opening track on a Harry Nilsson album. Moreover, you are, you are the co-owner of, you co-creditor of a song together. There's a song by Harrison Idol named The Pirate Song. So I wonder, how does it feel to really collaborate with culture heroes that tend to be your friends at some point? Well, that's two parts, but I don't know whether people, do people know Harry Nilsson these days? Everybody knows him, yes. Really? Not yes. everybody, <laughs> clearly. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he was great and a, and a wonderful man. But uh, the, the George one was because he came on my show, Rutland Weekend Television, and I persuaded him to be my special guest. And it was a, it was a Christmas show of Rutland Weekend Television, and he came lurching on, and he said, and he dressed as a pirate. He said, all right, I'm ready for the sketch. I said, well, what sketch? He said, the pirate sketch. And they said, well, actually, there isn't a pirate sketch. He said, no, there's got to be a pirate sketch. I said, no, no, we want you to sing My Sweet Lord. Oh, I'm not doing that. I want a pirate sketch. I said, well, I'm sorry, there is no pirate sketch. Well, up you then. And up you went. And then at the end of the show, 
that we cut to this big set and it says George Harrison sings and George came down and he had the white suit on and the 12 string playing ding da dang 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 and he played all that introduction and he went I want to be a pirate a pirate's life for me all my friends are pirates and they sail to BBC <laughs> so um, we wrote that so that you know <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it's almost as good as Lennon and McCartney, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds, sounds very good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we'll have to move on. Uh, yeah. Your Hey Jude would forever be always look on the bright side of life. And, and of course, again, can you tell us a little bit how it came to be, where the optimism come from, and how come, and, and did you really imagine that in, by 2018 people will still sing this song with so much spirit and vengeance? Well, <laughs> yes, of course, I knew all about that. Um, <laughs> I'd also imagine Google, you know, about yeah, it. No, I, no, no. Nobody believed me at the time. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, the fact was we were writing The Life of Brian, and what we got to as far, as far as the end, and all of our characters were headed for crucifixion. <laughs> So now we have to figure out how we're going to end the damn movie, you know. So I said, well, let's end with a song. And they said, oh, that's got a nice idea. I said, we can be being crucified and sing from the crosses. And they said, oh, that's really bad. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Gilliam said, and we can dance as well, you know. So uh, I said, well, it has to be a ridiculously optimistic song like looking on the bright side and it, it should be like a, a Disney song it should have a little whistle and so they said oh it's really good and they put it in the script said we can stop for the day now and um, I went home and wrote it very, very quickly um, and brought it back the next day and they hated it no they liked it um, and it, it I mean you know when you think about it I mean it is a parody of an optimistic song because they're being crucified <laughs> there's not a lot to look forward to <laughs> You've got about 25 minutes if you're lucky. But then, so that was kind of, it, it, did, it made a real nice ending for the film. and People really liked it. Harry Nielsen recorded it, actually, mm -hmm. on, on one of his albums. But, um, yeah, so then about 15 years later, I had a friend who was a, uh, an English football player called Gary Lineker, who was my neighbour. And he said, they're singing your song on the terraces. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, whenever a team's losing very badly... <laughs> All the fans sing, oh, by look on the bright side of life, da 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 And it was all going around all the, all the stadiums in England. This is <laughs> caught on like wildfire. They re-released the song, and it went to number one in one of the charts. It was amazing. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of weird. And it, it developed its own life after that. I mean, during the, the Falklands War, HMS Sheffield was hit by an exocet and all the sailors sat on the deck waiting for rescue for three hours, singing Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. <laughs> so, and now, so it, so it became something that the English are very good at irony. I mean, they're probably all they're good at, really. <laughs> but uh, but now it's the number one song requested at British funerals. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, for the last ten years, it has been that. Replacing my way, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I like that. I think it's very, it sort of shows, because <laughs> it is ridiculously optimistic, but it also says, always look on the bright side of death, which is one of the lines in it, you know, just before you draw your terminal breath. Life's a piece of shit when you look at it. Uh, and, and, the, the, and, and so I love the fact that people go to funerals and they sing it. And of, of course, what you need at a funeral is always a good laugh. That's the most important thing, because it, it's the only thing that shakes you back into reality. So I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. I think that's nice. Yeah. And by the way, in, in front of the Queen, you changed the shit to spit. Apparently I did, yes. I think life's a piece of spit. But not in front of Prince Charles and yeah. not at the Olympic Games. Yeah. They let me say shit on the Olympic Games. <laughs> so only the Queen was uh, well, quite strict. Well, you have to respect Her Majesty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I think that we wrapped up very quickly the topic of music. Let's move uh, to... <laughs> Come on, give me a chance. Um, we, we, we'll move to comedy. If you want to. Okay, I, perfect. I, 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 you know, I'm here. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, again, in your book you write you, that you spent 12 years in uh, the Ofni, and which is a combination of an army and a prison. This is how you mentioned it. And, 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 and my question is again, and you, and you said that it was a perfect training for Python. 
So, so is becoming a comedian mostly the result of circumstances, as in your case, or is there a comic gene, as you refer in, in one of your books? <laughs> um, I'm not sure about the comic gene, but I do like the fact that you read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I was, uh, I, was a great irony of my life is I, I was, my dad was in the RAF from 1941 and he was actually killed in an accident hitchhiking home for Christmas in 1945. So having been in the Lancaster bomber all those years as a rear gunner, that's really kind of ironic and sort of kind of funny if you're not, you know, I was only two and a half. So, but the, the result of that was the RAF paid for my education. And they put me, in, we were in a boarding school, and it had been an orphanage. But the war gave it a shot in the arm, which is kind of good for business. Uh, because I went to this uh, boarding school in Wolverhampton, which is not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> um, and it, I was there 12 years, uh, from 7 to 19. And all the boys uh, in my class and in all that school all had lost their fathers in the war. So psychologically, it's very interesting, I think. You know, we'll get to it later. But um, <laughs> so it was, it was like um, you had to manufacture all your good times. So I, you learn how to be funny at the expense of authority, not that they knew, and then go over the wall to get beer and meet girls and do the normal things in life. Um, and so, and also sort of various privations, you know. I mean, they put you in the army once a week, so we'd have to march up and down the square from the age of 12, and I think by 14, I could strip a Bren gun, blindfold, and reassemble it. And, uh, you know, they do adventure training courses in Wales, where they send you, you know, with a compass and a piece of cheese <laughs> and a map reference over Snowdonia. And so, you know, that's quite tough, really, but compared to our boarding school, it was a doddle. <laughs> and all the rather more better schools, they're all, kids were crying and weeping and lying around, but we said, oh, come on, come on. And so I think, you know, filming is kind of tough and, and, and boring. It's a cl cross between the two of them. And I think that did prepare me, you know, to put up with that sort of stuff. Okay, so uh, Beyond the Fringe, you mentioned it in your book that uh, it was an epiphany for you can you describe to the young audience what was it all about and how did it really affect you? Well, um, growing up in the 50s, um, it was very restrictive. And the, the English you know, had the tough attitude, we, we've been through it all now, we can tough out the peace and all this. Um, but then I, there was this show uh, came on in the West End. It was Peter Cook, Co Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Jonathan Miller and Alan Bennett. And it was a review, it was like 1961, and I went to see this thing and I laughed my ass off. I rolled round the wall because I didn't know you were allowed to laugh at the Queen and the army and the, and the police uh, and all the things that kind of annoyed you. They, they laughed at and mocked and my, the scales dropped from my eyes and I got the album and I learned everything and I, that's all I ever wanted to be after that point uh, was to, to be a comedian, to be funny. And they, they came to Broadway, actually. They were, they were on in Broadway. And yeah. they By the way, you, you can still see them live on, uh, see them on YouTube. There's yeah. a complete show of them. So yeah. It's very entertaining. Uh, so now, because we were in Cambridge, and you moved to Cambridge and joined the Cambridge University Footlights Club, and it became something has a ve it has a very big role in British comedy. So can you tell us more, a little bit, about this Footlights Club and how come it became so important? Well, it uh, was. Uh, it's, this is the other Cambridge, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, um, and I was fortunate enough because I was stuck in a boarding school. I had nothing to do but learn. So I got more, <laughs> more, more qualifications than almost everybody else who had a decent life and went out at the weekends. So I got into Cambridge, and almost in my second term, I met John Cleese, and I was doing a college review. And I did a piece of his that he'd written, which was quite extraordinary. And it was great to meet him. And then she said, come and join the Footlights. And the Footlights was founded in 1883. And it was a review society. And I'm very proud of the thing, because I eventually became president of Footlights. And women were not allowed. So the first thing I, as a little oik, did was to change the rules and admit women to the Footlights, which was, uh, <laughs> I'm proud of that. And that was about 10 years before the colleges did. So, you know, it was, it was still just ahead of its time. Just. <laughs>
about the next question, I'm not sure if you can answer, but let's try it. The best of 60s music was probably written under the influence. However, in your book, you write, and I quote, the idea you could try to write comedy under the influence was anathema to us. Why was it so different? Well, this has happened when, you know, Python, we, with Python, we wrote business hours. <laughs> even, in, we, even when we went to Barbados to write a movie, we still write 10 to 1, have lunch, 2 to 5, you know. We just wrote, because we found, you know, it's better if you just have regular hours, then whatever you do, you can have fun afterwards. But um, when I went to do Saturday Night Live for the first time in 1976, I think it was the second season, I couldn't believe it, because the NBC Towers, you go into their offices and it just smelled of reefer all over the place. And they had their own doors locked, nobody came in, you couldn't do that at the BBC. I mean, they'd go nuts. But um, then they'd try and write on a Tuesday night, you know, smoking things and being... And it would take forever. <laughs> and they'd expect the host to stay up with them which is really boring. <laughs> but um, So I found that, that, that it wasn't very productive. Not, not that they weren't funny occasionally, but, all, <laughs> but that they wouldn't do what we always did. We were obsessive writers. We would rewrite. If that's not good enough, you give it to somebody else. Tighter, tighter, tighter. Python is just a group of writers who then acted everything because we'd do it better and we wouldn't have to bring other people in. But it's, <laughs> it's really about the control of writers, and that never really happens in any... You know, it doesn't happen, in, in, certainly in Hollywood, it doesn't happen on television, really, that the writers are in control. And I think it's one of the reasons that it's so wacky and so kind of still resonates a little bit. But with, with, with that SNL, they never heard of a rewrite. And uh, when you did the show, you, if you notice, they're always looking off. So if somebody's having a scene over here, they're reading the cues. So, Good evening. How are you? How are you? Are you all right? And so I found it very disconcerting. You had to come fake. The, the, whereas Python, we would rehearse for five days, learn it all, be on top of the material, and when we faced our audience, we knew what we were doing. But so I, di I didn't find it very... I found it, you know, uh, <laughs> it wasn't my kind of thing. I, we, we, we're much more, you know, control freaks about the writing. Mm -hmm. So now we switch from comedy to TV. Your first experience, per the book at least, is that you, you were as a writer only on The Frost Report and later on at I'm Sorry, I'll Read That Again. So was it uh, a big change for you to switch to become behind the scene just as a writer, pure writer? The, well, the, the Footlights Club it was, it was, it was in Cambridge and it had its own bar, which was one of the great appeals, uh, because the pubs closed at 10 and our bar would open at 10.30. So you could go along to the club. It had its own lunches. It had a little stage where you could try out material, where there were little concerts that you could try. And that's the, actually the only way to do comedy. You've got to stand on the stage and try it. And those who die must be got rid of <laughs> because it's, it's a very painful experience for them. So you either can do it or you have to leave. So um, that was very good training, but it also taught you how to write. And we were very, very fortunate, our generation, because the minute we left Cambridge, we all went straight into jobs, because David Frost brought us into television immediately. Uh, and we were writing on the radio immediately. So all of Python were writers on the Frost Report. And John Cleese was actually on the show, but the rest of us were writers. So, you know, it's just one of those Point. And again, it's because there was nobody in front of us. <laughs> we were, it was new areas. We were groundbreaking new areas, and the jobs were there. So I think we're great, greatly lucky people. Yeah. We are lucky as well, though, I must admit. Uh, the next experience was a children TV show, which was this. I don't know how many people watched it real, real life. Is this is oh, it, yeah. is it? Yeah. Wow. And um, again, how was it writing and starring in a TV show, and how did it affect your later writing and starring on the...? Well, the Footlights was always about writing and performing. So you'd write your own material and you'd perform it. And so you do reviews and you write and perform that. So that's what it was. So it was a natural step for us. We were just lucky enough to be offered a, a TV show, but it was a kid's show. And uh, I, this guy said, you, will you do the show? And I said, sure, but I want Michael Palin and Terry Jones. So they came in and we wrote it and we said, well, Let's not talk down to children. Let's not make it a children's show. We'll just be funny. We'll just make them laugh. We'll be absurd, and they'll like it. And they did. And you know, the only discipline about that is you can't be rude. 
which is also very good discipline because it's easy to be fucking rude, isn't it? <laughs> 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 I mean, it's a shock gets you a laugh, but it's, it's sort of cheating in a way. A useful cheating. <laughs> But we were prepared, and, and uh, Cleese and Chapman were writing for Peter Sellers at the time, movies. And their, their relaxation every week was to turn on our TV show at 5.25. And uh, they, they just loved it. And that's why they came to us and said, let's all do this show that John had been offered. And we'd been offered a very big show on an independent channel, but they didn't have a studio for another year. So we said, oh, well, we might as well do the one with Cleese for a bit, you know, just to see how that goes. <laughs> uh, but we never got to the other show. <laughs> and now, finally, after half an hour, we can talk maybe a tiny bit about uh, Monty Python Flying Circus, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I brought a couple of books, uh, again, the, the Bible, for me at least, uh, the entire scripts. And, and uh, the question is, again, most viewers or think about Monty Python as a revolution. However, in your book, you stress the fact that it's more like an evolution. So, so how can you...? Well, at, at this stage in the 60s, there were lots of little shows all bumping into each other and starting, you know, and then Python just... Python wasn't a big deal. I mean, when it started, it was late on a Sunday night. The BBC were opening up that time slot because nobody... They, it closed down. The Queen was on a horse. They played the national anthem, and then they said, good night, everybody, good night. And uh, they'd got everybody into bed. But the BBC re recognised that some people might be staying up a bit. And so <laughs> they wanted to put something on to see who was going to be there. And they didn't much care what it was. So that they, uh, which is as well, because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. And they said, well, what are you going to do? And we said, mm, don't really know. And they said, well, will there be a band? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, will there be guests? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Uh, film? Oh, yeah, film. We'll have film. Yeah, we'll do film. And so they said, oh, just go away and make 13. <laughs> Fantastic. Really great decision, because they, they didn't interfere. They didn't watch. They, they <laughs> It was just a per the, the BBC at that time was mainly filled with people who just left the RAF and smoked pipes and had beer, you know. Uh, jolly, jolly interesting show you guys are doing. Keep it up. Jolly good. <laughs> and uh, it was absolutely perfect. I mean, you know, I call it executive free comedy. And <laughs> if you see executive filled comedy, which Hollywood puts out, you'll know that it's terrible. <laughs> because you've got to let these idiots do what they do best, even if they can't explain it because comedy is the thing that you can't really explain or predict, but it's very necessary, because we all need to laugh. You know, it just shakes us a little bit into reality again. I think that's what it's doing. Um, but I don't know why, why it should be in primates. Although, I, in The Road to Mars, the book he was referring to earlier, I do, I do have... Um, it was, I tried to make this film with Robin Williams and Dan Aykroyd and David Bowie. They were, they were comedians on the road in space. I figured that in space, what they wouldn't have would be live entertainers, and that would be the most, um, main, the best thing you wanted to see was live people being funny. And they had a robot which was going to be played by David Bowie. <laughs> and he didn't understand what they were doing, because he's a robot. And he couldn't understand why they went on stage and people barked at them. And so he started to write a, a thesis called De Rerum Comedia uh, for, for the University of Saturn about what on earth this thing called comedy was. And it, it's quite interesting when you try and look at comedy coldly and objectively, because if there are other civilizations, or e e even, e you know, even other places where, human, uh, where life exists, would you expect there to be comedy? And I think you would. If there's intelligent life, it has to perceive of itself as being somewhat ridiculous because it's going to die. That, I mean, that's the basis of it. You're not here forever. And so that, that I, I find those sort of ideas kind of fun to play with and, and to examine. You know, and by being in, by being, you know, having two comedians, I could take the slightly pretentious nature of that discussion and make fun of it as well as, as, as exploring it. Does that make sense? A bit? So, uh, preparing for this talk, I, again, watched again and again old sketches uh, on YouTube. Everything is available, of course, in relatively good quality. Uh, Thank you, Google. Yeah. <laughs> we spent all those years trying to connect these sketches together. And what do you get on YouTube? Disparate little sketches here and there. Yeah, but, 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 but the funny thing... <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe it's not funny, but 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 the funny thing is still that uh, I, I I I started looking at the videos, and then of course like every YouTuber, I started looking at. Uh, Talkbacks because it's much more interesting than the videos themselves, and and there were <laughs> and uh, it's 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 true. But uh, and and but two two things really struck me. One of them was that all the com most of the comments were very positive as opposed to most comments which you can find on YouTube. <laughs> and, and second and secondly is that they are very recent. It's not from 20 years ago. The comments are from last week. So I wonder, how can you explain the fact that these sketches still appeal to young people in the 21st century? Uh, I don't understand. <laughs> it shouldn't happen. Next year is the 50th anniversary of Python. It went on the air in... Thank you, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> And we're going to celebrate by doing fuck all. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all going to do it together, probably. But um, no, it's, it, it, seems, it seems absurd. I mean, it was 1969. It's, if, you know, it seems impossible that some... The comedy, particularly, which tends to be about in the moment or what we're thinking about at the time, last, could last that long. And I think it's partly because it isn't in the moment. It's not satire. We followed a satire boom in England, so there's, there's nothing that connects it to the time in which it's at. It's about characters and generic comedy about human behaviour, um, and it's, it's very silly. It's kind of it's still endearing, but I think the most important thing about it is it's digital. We're right at the beginning of the digital world. You know, the BBC, you know, it's, we've gone from film and everything to tape. We're on, you know, two-inch Ampex being taped, and so it's still in pixels. And you can polish them up still, so it can still look fresh. And we were in colour by three months. Because if it was in black and white, you're in the I Love Lucy and Honeymooners territory, and it looks like forever in the past. But I think there's something, to, something with that, both that it's not tied into time like an early SNL, so you have to remember, oh, Gerald Ford fell over a lot, that's why Chevy's doing that. <laughs> you don't have to have those references. You can still come in. And, and find it silly, I think. Yeah. Silliness definitely strikes out, yeah. Comes out. Uh, I heard somewhere that you describe yourself as the sixth nicest python. Is that so? <laughs> I think I was exaggerating a little, but... Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, I mean, it's... Um, poor old Michael always got lumbered with being called the nice one. Uh, and uh, occasionally I'm mistaken for Michael Palin when I'm, you know, on the road and going around. And I, when I'm mistaken for Michael Palin, I always say, yes, I am Michael Palin. Now, fuck off, you ugly old kid. <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of helps to destroy his character, you know, a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Holy Grail, your... your... You, you did this movie, didn't you? Yeah, we uh, did. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we did yeah. it. Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't sure about it for a second. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, you, you write in the book that some of the scenes you have, that you had to show the film on th 13 test screenings until you were happy with the result. Yeah. And I asked myself, how come it was so different from TV? Because on TV you were quite confident on, on, on your material. Well, on TV we would do one a week and we would rehearse for five days, the writing is all done, and then we'd play it to an audience. And the thing about an audience is they tell you where it's funny. And you cut the bits where they don't laugh, you take it away. And that's the editing process. But in a film, you, you don't have that. You have this, like, 95 minutes and then... Um, and so we, you know, they laugh here, then they don't, and they stop, and then they get bored. And um, we had a f completely disastrous first screening uh, and then we all got together because we were, qu we're quite good at writing and rewriting and editing. And so we started to tackle it and we had 13 different cuts until we finally made it really funny where the audience would laugh all the way through and there wouldn't be a bit where they stopped. And if you put laughs together, then people get on a roll and they're still laughing when the next gag comes along. And that's what you're trying to do live on stage normally, automatically, you're sort of feeling that. But in a film, it takes much more to drag it to where the audience response and so most films don't get that I mean that's quite unusual and I think it's one of the reasons the film sort of survives and is still pretty funny yeah. apart from 10 year olds love it because <laughs> there is adults pretending to ride horses you know they, <laughs> which is what they do all the time so <laughs> uh, uh, 
I know many people, again, even my close family relatives, regretfully, who can act out <laughs> scenes from Holy Grail and, and, and Life of Brian in entirety. So I, I wonder, how do you feel about such people who can really refer to it as, as the uh, Old Testament or New Testament or whatever? Not that many laughs in the Old Testament, yeah. are there? Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I did exactly the same. When I saw Beyond the Fringe, I absolutely bought the album and I absolutely learned all of the monologues that Peter Cook did and Alan Bennett did a, a vicar and I, I learned it. I think, I, I, why do we learn songs? I think it's the same thing when you're young, you know, you like this song and you learn it and then you like this comedy, so you learn it. I, I think those are the two important pillars of becoming teenager and growing up. And, and that's why the, the, everything turns over so quickly, because there's another bunch along who are rejecting what the people in front of them just liked. Yeah. Uh, moving on to Life of Brian. Uh, it was a lot of controversy when it came out, but definitely it cannot be compared to what happened when John said this quote about Bills, be, Bills being more popular than Jesus. They didn't burn your records or didn't didn't become violent. So what do you think changed between 66 and 79? And, and, and how do you think it would, would have been accepted if it come out today, in today's... Uh... Well, that's a different question. I think that today is different. People say, well, why wouldn't you do it about um, Muslims? And we say, well, we actually, we grew up as Christians. We were forced to go to church twice on Sundays for 10, 15 years, and that was our heritage. We'd, uh, so we are allowed to be funny about that. If you were just randomly funny about any other religion that you haven't experienced, I don't think you have the, I think you have the right, to, well, you made the right, but I mean, it's, it's not what we would have done. We were specifically looking at this particular Church of England, really, which hardly exists anymore, but, um, and what was interesting to us is when we, it, it all came from the opening of Holy Grail, where in New York, uh, I opened my big mouth and somebody said, what's the next Python film going to be? And I said, Jesus Christ, lust for glory. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I've had therapy. <laughs> it doesn't seem to help. <laughs> uh, and then when we got back to England, Cleese said, actually, that's a very interesting subject. Nobody's ever done religion. And what I was saying about the blank field is really attractive, because you're not going in well, or this is the 13th comedy about religion. There's, nobody's done this. And why is, is, is a very interesting question. Why, are, why don't people do that? And so we studied it because we're all Oxford and Cambridge. You know, we did about a month's research reading the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, all sorts of books on, on the Bible and, what, you know, what was going on. And then we all sort of talked about it and we said, well, you can't actually make fun of Jesus Christ because everything he's saying is, is uh, uh, you know, love your neighbor, um, blessed are the poor, look after people, be kind and gentle. Isn't, people don't do that today, but that's, uh, that's what the, the religion says, really. And so we don't want to do cheap jokes about JC. That's not going to be what we're going to do. But what is funny about religion is how people take over people and force them to become cult members and, you know, make them uh, behave and, and force them to not think, really, but obey. And so that's really what the subject of the film became as we explored it, which is, uh, we're all individuals. I'm not. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> that, that's really the sort of... Um, <laughs> That, that's the sort of, I think it's a very healthy, uh, so, and, and really quite good, nice people, you know, religious people, really enjoyed the film because they noticed that it was actually not mocking religion, but actually rather reinforcing some of the better things about it. So, um, <laughs> the only thing was that we were supposed to come to America to to sort of sell it, you know, they were going to fly in for junkets. And uh, I think the first was the rabbis came out in New York and protested, and we went, what? <laughs> and then they went back in again. They said, oh, sorry. <laughs> and, then, and then there were big pickets outside Warner Brothers, and it said, Monty Python, uh, no, it said, Warner Brothers, agents of the devil. 
and everybody knows that CAA. Uh, so, that, but, so, but we didn't have to come because it was on the news all over the place. And once you're on the news, and also the other thing is once you try and stop Americans doing something, they won't do that because freedom of speech actually means something. It's the only country that has it and it's absolutely vital. And so they would go and see it in another town that had taken it. If one had taken it off, they go to the next town. So um, it, it sort of, we didn't have to do anything. We just, you know, we rather missed the trip. <laughs> it was sad, really. <laughs> People are going to kill me because they have something like 20, 100 more questions about science and literature and meaning of life, which you're very uh, familiar with. But uh, I think that maybe we'll open the floor for a couple of questions from uh, people here, and uh, we can later proceed. So please go ahead. Let's do it. Nicely quickly. lit, by the way. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Eric. Uh, answer me these questions three. I'm only going to give you one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've witnessed admiration from uh, Americans since I moved here about 18 years ago uh, of the UK's progressive, po uh, uh, progressive politics and attitudes. Uh, but then we've got Brexit. And growing up in Stockport, just outside of Manchester, I've seen bigotry and race and gender be really big obstacles uh, from like the, the football hooligan crowd to seeing it on TV as well. Um, how do you reconcile the gap? And how successfully do you think that satire uh, skirts the line between parody and reinforcement? Well, you have to remember, I have now been in America nearly 25 years. Um, so I don't, I, when I go back to England, I don't recognize it. It's not the England I left. And I think everywhere is changing all the time. But you don't notice it because you're there all the time. And I think you're, don't forget, Python, we were only addressing people from 1969 on television to 1973. That's all we were on. Mm. And then it, then it was on in America. So I think that England is rather good on, on the satire. They seem to have very good comedians. They seem to be not racist. They seem to be, you know, they seem to be quite modern and quite progressive, um, except for the politicians who seem to think that Brexit is a good idea. <laughs> but, you know, it's like Dunkirk 2. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Hey, Eric, uh, what's, what's funny to you today? Comedians, shows, movies, what, what makes you laugh? Well, I, I have a couple of, of, of girls who make me laugh a lot, uh, and they're called Garfunkel and Oates. Do you know them? Yeah, and, uh, yeah they're really good. And they're, they're very beautiful and very young, and they write lyrics much filthier than even I've ever written. So <laughs> I, I just love them. Um, I, I think there's a, there's, a lot of good, there's a lot of good comedy here, but to me the most interesting thing is that I think since the, the George Bush time, um, people get their news now from comedy. And that's, I think The Daily Show started it, John Stewart. But now my, my missus watches The Daily Show, Trevor Noah, and then Colbert, and then Seth Meyers. Every night she has to watch this. And that's, it's interesting to me now that in order to, I suppose it's a counter to Fox, you know, which is unintentionally funny. Uh, <laughs> um, we can't trust the news anymore, so we get it from comedians, and I think that's quite interesting. I don't quite understand it, but I think it's quite healthy. So, um, you were mentioning how people sort of memorize the work, and th these things are just sort of embedded in our brains after so long. And I'm sure that you regularly have people just come up and regurgitate your material back at you uh, out of the blue and uh, nudge nudge wink wink say no more all that stuff <laughs> i'm wondering if there are episodes that have happened that stand out in your mind where you were really taken aback or caught off guard or were surprised at the way someone worked your own material back into an encounter with you hmm you mean like obama or somebody like that <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Her Majesty breaking into the Lumberjack song oh. or something. Well, I did sing Brightside to Her Majesty, and I did make her laugh, and that was very good. And I did it for Prince Charles, too. But I, I wore a tutu and a wig, and I, I danced around these little ballet dancers. But um, I don't think... I mean, people do do that. They, uh, they seem to do it less. I, maybe once you become more firm at stopping them. But uh, there's nothing you can say if somebody does that to you. you go, hey, nice, nice, know what I mean? Say no more. And you go, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
well, my plight, flight's leaving, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it isn't the conversation. And that's the true of all celebrity encounters. I always try and break that and say, hi, I'm Eric, what's your name? And then you have a real human reaction and you're meeting somebody. And they're not meeting something that is a sort of, well, you know, they, call it, they call us legends now, which, of course, legends are, are people who are dead and not true. <laughs> So, uh, so I, I mean, it's, it's, you have to learn how to deal with that, otherwise you become a jerk. <laughs> My wife still thinks I am a jerk, but, you know. <laughs> but thank you. So you mentioned that you guys, like, really worked really hard at uh, rewriting and rewriting and practicing for Python, but when I watch it, or when I watched it as a kid, it really gave me the impression of being very sp spontaneous. Uh, so could you say a little bit about how Th those seemingly conflicting, um, like how you resolve that, or how you make spontaneity sure. out of so much work. Well, the, the, the motto of the Footlights is Ars est calare artem, which I'm sure I don't need to translate for you, cause <laughs> <laughs> but it means the art is in concealing the art. And so even last night when I had a long conversation with David Hyde Pierce, he spent two weeks writing and thinking about how to do this, and then it was effortless for him. And that's, I think that's the thing. It has to look effortless, but it's a lot of work. Um, uh, and so, the, so the, of the comedy we did, it, it, we, we didn't, nobody did improvisation, with the exception of Peter Cook, in our day. And, and improv came around in the, sort of the 80s, and now it's all stand-up. But we weren't that. We were sketch comedy. So you could perfect the sketch in the writing stage, then, then, then rehearse it, and then kill with it. But, so I, th I think all good work is hard work. And I think with writing, all good writing is rewriting. I think you really have to work hard and then make it look effortless if you can. That's my tip. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Hello. I hope you still like Chinese. <laughs> Are we allowed to sing, sing that anymore? I had to change yeah. the lyrics slightly. All right. but, yeah. <laughs> 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 so, like, you mentioned earlier about the uh, blank fields in comedy. So, like, in your opinion, what are the uh, blank fields today that still yet to be explored? What are they? Yeah. Well, it's very hard. I mean, you know, I mean, I would say that when you look at Trump, if you didn't know, you could put a laugh track on it because it is kind of insane. You know, it's wonderfully mad humor. And, and I love the fact that he did his usual material to the UN and the, the world laughed at him. <laughs> and then he had the balls to say they were laughing with him. <laughs> and then they asked for the UN and the people said, no, 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 we will not. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, I mean, I think, I always think that comedy is like the Emperor's New Clothes. It's the kid who says he's not wearing any clothes. Then everybody laughs. And I think that's very much what's happening at the moment. Um, and and uh, I think it's, it's, people need it. Uh, it it sort of reassures you. It's a balanced, it's a truth te testing. It's a test against reality. And I, I think that's its uses and its excuse and, and why it's healthy. Thank uh, you very much. Sure. I'd like to read a bit in conclusion, just a tiny little bit, and I think you rather, this is rather relevant, so you'll, if you'll bear with me, to, it, it's, not, it's not really long, uh, and it's, of course, about death. Uh, um, and I'm talking about my song, uh, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life, which is the, the theme of the book. And it's, I say, my funeral song will go on and on, though obviously we don't. Dust to dust is about right. We dissipate into the carbon atoms we came from. Technically, reincarnation is sort of correct. We get reassembled into other things. I'd like to be reassembled into a Tesla so my <laughs> wife can still drive me. <laughs> I was born in the same place as my mother, and I wonder if I'll die there, which would mean our home in L.A. To be precise, in our guest room. But that's now become my wife's shoe closet. <laughs> I think I wouldn't mind dying in there amongst the Jimmy Choo's. I worship the ground she works on anyway, so that would be appropriate. She, who sadly knows me best, thinks my last words will probably be, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't look good on a tombstone. So instead, I would like on my grave, Eric Idle, see Google. <laughs> Thank you.